behind the scenes of writing not just Obama's wars, but the previous book that you worked on. So that gives us a great sense of the process. And now we'll have a conversation. Um, I'd like to do, as they say, take the prerogative of the, the chair to start on the question of Obama's wars, and then we can move in any direction the audience wishes to go, um, including back to, I mean, I've got the first and the most recent right here. We can go back to Gordon Liddy and plumbers and jackhammers if you wish. So we'll see what the audience wants to do. But I would like to ask, because I do follow Afghanistan very closely, and I read this book uh, very, very closely. You can see my notes of what I thought was... I, I see paper clips also. Paper clips, yes. notes. My wife knows that I go through these things and, and call out everything that the I... The margin note about. here says, how can he possibly say this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, well, he didn't say who he is. and <laughs> There was a comment. I remember writing a note. But there is a very important point in the book and you've already mentioned exit strategy, uh, and about President Obama's search for a way to deal with Afghanistan and to make sure that it was not seen as the endless war. And in his speech, which was given in December of last year at West Point, he put out a date of July 2011. And that would be the date when American troops would begin to withdraw from Afghanistan. And as we know in the title of your book, Obama's Wars refers not just to the war in Afghanistan, but the wars within the White House and within the White House and the military about how to proceed. Just last week in Lisbon, a new date was put on the table, 2014. And it was announced that the United States would maintain its combat presence in Afghanistan until the end of 2014 along with some of our NATO allies. So my question is, is Obama's war internal war over, has a date been decided, or do you think that this internal struggle is going to continue? Well, well as anyone knows, uh, in common sense teaches you, you can't schedule the end of a war. And uh, the July 2011 date comes from, uh, as the book shows, at one of the endless meetings, Bob Gates, the Secretary of Defense, just says, oh, I think we can start thinning out, that's his language, thinning out our forces from Afghanistan in uh, 18 to 24 months. Obama seizes on this like uh, somebody grabbing a, a life raft. And uh, in fact, uh, Gates doesn't remember exactly saying this, but Obama seized on it and took the 18 months and said, okay, we're going to begin a drawdown, a thinning out. Uh, obviously, it's alarmed the military. They don't uh, like it, the great resistance to it, though they all signed up and said, yes, this is something we can do. I think the new date of July 2014 comes as a manifestation of that unhappiness in the military and elsewhere. Uh, gee, uh, July 2011 is only six months away. How would we start withdrawing even a couple of hundred troops? It would send a signal that the United States is leaving, that it's over, and the psychology of this is so important. And so they have now come up with 2014 uh, as the date where there would be no combat forces. Well. Uh, in Iraq, we now have 50,000 forces, uh, 50,000 troops, and they say those are not combat forces. How many people believe those are not combat forces? I know one of the battalion commanders, and it is one of the most lethal uh, uh, battalions in the United States Army. Yes, they do not initiate contact, supposedly, unless they're asked by the Iraqis, but there are, you know, 50,000 troops uh, are very real. I think Obama wants to follow the Iraq model. He cited it in his West Point speech uh, last December. Uh, quite interestingly enough, uh, held Iraq up as uh, something uh, we should try to repeat in Afghanistan. So I think that's the goal here. 
Well, I would like to continue asking questions because last night Bob Woodward was on Larry King and I watched Larry ask the questions. On Sunday he was on Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer. I watched Bob Schieffer ask the questions. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to turn this over to the audience. <laughs> so uh, with uh, Al Gore's uh, um, claim that we know about 1% and your estimation of 60 to 70%, can you talk a little bit about how credible and authentic the the leaked items might be and what they change, if anything? Uh, the WikiLeaks, I think, are authentic uh, and uh, credible. But uh, in the classification system, with, which Rick knows well, uh, the documents that WikiLeaks got are only secret. And top secret is, uh, that's where the real story is told, is that fair to say? Uh, and so not having uh, the top secret documents, you have Al Gore's dilemma. You are seeing something uh, without the really good stuff. And uh, it is necessarily distorting. Uh, and uh, there is, is, best I can tell, none or very little intelligence information. Uh, there is, uh, there's a whole bigger picture in these relationships. Uh, the, the other question uh, about WikiLeaks, which I think is very important, is the question of standing. Uh, an ambassador sends in a cable, it goes to the State Department, uh, Almost all of the time, it never makes it to the White House. It's very unusual for an ambassador's cable to make it to the White House. Where are decisions made, particularly in this administration? The White House. And so a lot of this does not have standing. I remember uh, doing editing one weekend at the Washington Post, and there was a reporter who thought he had the most important story in history because he had talked to a lieutenant colonel in the Pentagon who was drafting up contingency war plans for us to attack a certain country. Uh, it turned out uh, it was true. They were contingency plans. Uh, the plans had no standing at the highest level of the Pentagon, let alone uh, the White House uh, at that time. So you were, you're, you've seen something that's very uh, incomplete. The New York Times has said uh, this provides an uh, unvarnished uh, account of how some of the biggest decisions are made in the United States government. I think that's uh, an extreme exaggeration. It is a glimpse. Uh, it is not the real story. Uh, if, if I may say, uh, some of the detail and comments by the principals, including the president and the vice president, secretary of defense, that we have in this book from notes tell you much more about what's really going on. Uh, just for example, uh, at one of the meetings, President Obama, in talking about Pakistan and the dilemma that al-Qaeda and the uh, Taliban uh, leadership is in Pakistan, not Afghanistan. He says, we need to make clear that the poison is in Pakistan. That one sentence tells you more about his understanding, the policy, and the dilemma that he faces as commander in chief. Could I ask you to comment whether sure. or not WikiLeaks is another example of the Pentagon Papers, or are these two cases different? Uh, very different uh, at this point. Now, maybe there are going to be more documents. Uh, we've only seen uh, part of what's going on, but they're not, you know, the story tomorrow is about Pakistan from the documents. It was about the Middle East yesterday. Uh, it was about, uh, so it's all over the lot. There's no theme. Uh, anyone who's young remember what the theme from the Pentagon Papers, 1971, was? Pardon? Vietnam, right? What was the theme? G government line uh, showed conclusively that uh, the government had regularly and persistently lied about what was going on in the Vietnam War. 
so far on WikiLeaks, I've seen nothing that uh, really says the government has not told us uh, the truth. Uh, now, there are examples where they've not told the whole, whole story, but that is always the case in government. Another question um, right here, right in front. Could you also introduce yourself as you're asking questions and please stand? Hi, my name is Willie Powers and I'm a group manager at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management right across the street. Good for you. I'm a little, always interested in a, um, in a journalist sources. Um, how do you rely on or do you rely on um, submitting for your request to collect um, details for your book? Um, almost all of the sources uh, we used in this book are human sources. Uh, submitting freedom of information requests uh, gets clogged up in the system. You don't get the stuff in a timely way. I submitted some freedom of information requests in the 1980s, the Reagan administration. A couple of years ago, they actually answered them and gave me documents, uh, heavily redacted, and for 20 years I'd had the unredacted version of those documents <laughs> from a human source. Uh, there's nothing like a good cooperating source who wants to explain what's going on. I remember once asking Bill Casey, who was the CIA director for Reagan, would you rather have a listening device in the prime minister's office abroad or a good human source in the prime minister's office and instantly he said a human source who uh, is cooperating and honest because from the listening device you could wind up getting hundreds of pages of transcript each day and you wouldn't know what was important the wonderful thing about the human being uh, is that the human being can sift and select and say this is what's important, this is the conversation, this is the decision, uh, this is the impact. So uh, human beings are vital. Uh, at the same time, we were fortunate uh, in this book to get a good number of documents or have those documents read to us so you see exactly what was said at that moment. Question um, in the middle. Again, we'll just sort of go across this way. So yep. keep your questions. Um, I'm Luke. I'm a sophomore. Um, I was just wondering. You've written a lot of books recently covering war, and I'm just wondering how you decide what to write on, and if it's possible that we could get a book covering something like the healthcare process. It's I'm sure a we'd great all question. It. It's a great question. Uh, I. Pick wars in the, in the, in the case of uh, Bush. Uh, when Bush uh, became president, I decided that the defining event for the Bush presidency was going to be the Bush tax cut. And so I spent eight or nine months working on the Bush tax cut. On 9-11, even I realized that the defining event in the Bush presidency was not going to be the tax cut, but the response to 9-11. So I shifted. If you know anyone who would like to write a book about the Bush tax cut, <laughs> please send them to me, because I have boxes of documents and interviews. What is true about war, if you travel abroad at all, uh, our wars define who we are to the world. And I think in a more important way, they define who we are to ourselves. They go down in the history books for good reason. The decision, particularly uh, George Bush's decision to invade Iraq, to initiate a war, is an extraordinary decision. And uh, is defined in so many ways, directly or indirectly, uh, the first 10 years of this century. So war matters. The other element here, quite practically, is the process of deciding national security issues is much more 
regularized. There are National Security Council meetings. There are principals meetings before. There are deputies meetings. People keep notes. People keep records. The State Department, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies, the White House, some of the other departments are involved. So you can get the sort of concrete detail that will explain the evolution of the decision making. Had uh, I picked health health care, I don't, you know, don't, I don't know. I uh, anybody here uh, read the two thousand page bill? Anyone understand what health care reform is? Raise your hand. There's a job opening for you. Uh, it's very confusing. I did a book, first book I did on Clinton was called The Agenda about his economic plan and that was clearly focused in a uh, given period of time, something he had run on uh, as a candidate. So it was much easier to do that, but you know, m maybe I'm missing something on the healthcare decision making. These are um all the books that you've done, or so many of them, not all, but so many of them, we have President Nixon here, we have President Obama here. Something that you said when you were on Face the Nation that you had thought at one point of naming this book a divided man? The, the divided man. The, could you explain that? Because this is about President Obama. Yes, uh, because uh, when you, uh, and maybe you would disagree with this having read uh, through the book, uh, Intellectually, he understands that it's a pretty dreary story in Afghanistan. He understands and actually told me when I interviewed him, he said, I, we can absorb another terrorist attack. A uh, very unusual thing for a president to say. Um, so intellectually, he understands how hard it is. He understands how hard it is in Pakistan, an ally, a sovereign state that is harboring our enemies, not uh, Al-Qaeda, but uh, the Taliban. Uh, in the book, I describe how uh, the Taliban fighters go from Afghanistan fighting US troops back to Pakistan for rest and relaxation, get equipped, have the weekend off, get new, get more training, and then go back into Afghanistan and are waved through Pakistani checkpoints. Uh, and these people are going to kill American soldiers. So Obama realizes how hard it is. At the same time, the other half of this division is he fully understands he's commander in chief. He inherited this war. He said, this is the war I'm gonna add resources to and take seriously. So he's got that leadership role, uh, and at the same time, uh, he is pulled back. And, the, and, and this is why after the strategy review session last year, uh, to my knowledge, he never talks about winning or victory in Afghanistan, which is very unusual for a commander in chief. Okay, um, in the back again, and then we're gonna come down And the jackhammer has stopped. Yes. All right, thank you. I'm Dan Union Ro rules. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dan Rosenson. I'm a senior. Um, and I've read Obama's Wars, and I was pleasantly surprised to see a lot of uh, policy debate and substance. And I say pleasantly surprised because the media coverage of the book, uh, including in the Washington Post, seemed to focus on the, the personal debates, the bickering, the sort of gossip. And I just have to ask, as, as a journalist, as an author, doesn't that bother you? <laughs> um, yeah, it does, but it, but it happens all the time. I agree with you. I mean, people have actually written reviews of the book saying there's no discussion, there's no analysis, there's no debate about the policy. Actually, it is only the debate about the policy. And... Uh, Reviewers are going to see things the way they want to see it, but happily this, there are a group of uh, very serious people out there who read the book and I think get it and, and understand it. Um, 
at, at the same time, you, you have to, when somebody reads a book, uh, you never remember everything, obviously, and uh, sometimes the dramatic moments stick in your head the most, and, you know, General Jones calling the people in the West Wing who are the uh, political advisors water bugs or a uh, member of the mafia, the campaign set, gets your attention. And so those things tend to stick with you, and I think they tend to stick with reviewers. But that's, that's part of the, the debate about a book and uh, the evaluation of it. Do you think his, General Jones's references to water bugs and mafia hastened his departure? I, I don't know the answer to that. I think, uh, I know and I put in the book that he was planning on leaving mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the year anyway. He left earlier. Um, I haven't reported that story out thoroughly. Yeah. Next question. Um, one more in the back. We have the mic close at hand. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Koprud. I'm with Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. Um, I'm going to be in Afghanistan uh, for two weeks in March. Um, I'm not a writer by trade, but I'm going to be interviewing people and doing human impact stories. Um, do you have any you, advice? You're interviewing people yeah, for what? Um, I'm traveling with a nonprofit who does microfinance work. Yeah. And so what are you going to be asking them about? Well, that's actually my question. Um, this is not something that I do. Um, crazy place to go to do it for the first time, I know. But um, you know, how do you get the story from people? How do you find their truth? How do you pull out the essence of what they want to tell you? Thank you. It takes time. And you have to go back. Uh, Evelyn, I think you saw as you went through the interviews, particularly of people who were interviewed for the third, the fourth, or the 15th time, you, you peel uh, the onion and you get down to more central truths. So it's very hard in two weeks to interview people uh, many times. You have to uh, build a relationship of trust with them. Uh, if I was involved in what you were doing, I would urge you to do 10 interviews in two weeks and then re-interview all of those people. So you do 20 interviews, say, and instead of interviewing 20 people. Uh, I think going back is central to understanding, and in, in the course of doing that, you might uh, say, you know, the first interview is not very good, so I'm going to move on to a second person, but, f but find people who are cooperating, who will answer your questions, build that relationship of trust, and uh, I think one of the elements in all of this is you need to convince people you take them as seriously as they take themselves. Common feature of the human being, the, all humans tend to take themselves quite seriously, and if you demonstrate that, if you come in and just say, you know, I have three questions, uh, that is kind of off-putting. I've been interviewed by uh, all kinds of journalists, from Mike Wallace to book people to people doing three-hour interviews. And often I've been offended, quite frankly, when somebody comes and interviews me on a serious subject for only half, a, half an hour. Uh, so I would take time and communicate that to somebody. Now, whether that applies to what you're doing, uh, I hope it does. We've just extended this for another hour, so we can have plenty of time to... <laughs> we, want, we want to let you know that we take this very seriously. Um, Good. And so your first comment was take time. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I have no problem with that. I mean, I, this is a serious audience, and uh, I don't have anything I have to do, so... <laughs> and also take Evelyn with you. Yes. Maybe she okay. could, we can go. Um, okay, let's come down to here in the, in the front with the mic, if we could. This gentleman. I, I think that woman in the back in the green. Yeah, okay, let's kinda, try yeah, that. See, let her ask we'll, we'll, first. We'll do we, that, and then we'll come down to the gentleman thank you. here. Yeah. I could tell she has a good question. <laughs> you bet I do. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm Megha, and I'm a graduate student here at the Elliott School. 
Uh, I wanted to know, um, I was a journalist I, and a media student in India, and I read about you and it's great seeing you in person now. I was wondering, how have you seen investigative journalism change over the years? And do you think there's a risk of desensitizing people, especially with WikiLeaks? And do you think all the president men, all the president's men had a, more of an impact than Obama's wars, especially in the information age? Uh, your la question about all the president's men and Obama's wars was what? Was that, uh, do you think all the president's men had, a, had more of an impact than Obama's wars because we're in the information age and people are uh, bombarded with so much information already? Well, all the president's men was about reporting crimes uh, uh, involving uh, the president's men and it turned out the president himself. And so that had an impact that uh, uh, is very unusual in journalism. Uh, the question about the change, evolution uh, in investigative reporting is a, uh, a really good question. And uh, when Carl Bernstein and I were working on the Watergate story, we could uh, work two or three weeks on one story. And we would type it on things called typewriters, if you've <laughs> seen them, and on six-ply paper. So there were... Uh, there was an original and five automatic carbons when you typed it and then the carbon copies would go to all the editors and we would have meetings and they would question us and they would say, what about these sources? Uh, get more information. Uh, somebody would have a doubt about something. Somebody would say, you know, I know somebody who uh, will be able to help you with this story. It, it, so it was done in an atmosphere uh, not the atmosphere we live in now of the internet, cable news, you know, pounding, impatience, speed, speed, get it out. Now, if you get a story at the Washington Post, some will, would come into my office and hear about it and say, uh, you know, can we get even just a minor advance in a story or the appearance of an advance in the story, can we get it on the website by noon? want to churn it out. Uh, I represent the old school of uh, patience, total patience, and slow. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry. I think you've got to go back, as I say. I think you have to kind of, the process Evelyn has described very well of, what's this book about? What happened? Uh, can we trust this? Can we verify this? Let's, we got lots of meeting notes, NSC notes, which are, is a blessing and a curse. Is that fair to say? Because if you, we would write a very long version and someone would read it, uh, the editor in New York, and say, you know, that sounds like a meeting, because it goes this way and that way, and it needs to be more, more focused, more direct. Uh, but it, it, a very slow, detailed process. After I interviewed President o Obama in the summer about the book, uh, he, he said, uh, I'm sure jokingly, he said, you have better sources than I do. <laughs> and then he said, uh, have you ever thought about being CIA director? <laughs> I pointed out to him that I realized that was not a job offer, <laughs> which it was not. Um, could, could I follow up on that? Are you concerned about the blogosphere? Because, I mean, for newspapers, you, you mentioned your editors, you, they're fact checkers, you take time, you're patient, make sure you, you get the story right. Now the demand to get out there 24-7, and people are blogging and putting out stuff out there, there's no fact checking. Yeah, yeah, that's true, but it, it, it's there, and we, we operate, uh, thank God, under the First Amendment, so you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what value is it going to have in the marketplace? Uh, you meet people and they say, oh, I'm a blogger for, you know, something you've never heard of, and there is a marketplace, and a lot of these people are just going to be out of business. You can't sit around blogging unless you can discover or design a business model uh, to make a living. So I think all of that will uh, get smaller, quite frankly, rather than larger. I get on 
Google alerts uh, when my name is mentioned on some blog, and I'll look at the blog, I've never heard of it, and you look at uh, the comments at the end, zero, and you wonder if actually uh, anyone is reading this, uh, or if it has any impact, if it has any coherence. Now, some, of, some people do a terrific job. Tom Ricks uh, at Foreign Policy, his blog on Pentagon and military matters is uh, quite astute, but he's somebody who worked for 20 years at the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and has that background. So the market will be a regulator? I think in the end it's going to be. I don't think, uh, yeah, or, you know, I used to joke about Watergate if, uh, the Washington Post would not publish the stories we wrote. We could have written the stories in letters home to our mothers, uh, but it would have no resonance. I think some of this blogging is the equivalent of letters home to mother. And, uh, you know, but we'll see. I, I certainly could be wrong. I'm not troubled by it, quite frankly. My concern is that there aren't enough people doing the in-depth reporting. I mean, the questioner asked about health care. I mean, that is a mind-boggling issue and bill, and who's going to unravel it? Uh, because it needs to be unraveled. There's a politicalization of health care reform on both sides, and I'd sure like to know what the facts are and how this evolved and what it means. In terms of the health care bill, I think the Republicans say they're going to unravel it. <laughs> well, we'll see. That's, that's part of their agenda. Uh, right here. The gentleman right there. Hi, um, I'm from Japan. I'm, I'm Jap Japanese ju journalist right now, a uh, fellow at the American University. And I can say uh, it's not just Americans. Uh, all of us, like the Japanese, are reading your book and learning about the journalism. And, but the thing is, it's related to the question. Uh, when I got here and, and I saw even the Washington Post like a layoff to the reporters and at the same time there's uh, ProPublica and all these nonprofit journalism. And my question is, what do you see about the, the future of journalism, which uh, no doubt would be the, the rest of the country, J Japan, the Western Europe, they, they all follow the American the society, so that would be the future of the, the journalism. So I would like to know about the, what the future of journalism, and if you ever consider about, like, a, you quit the Washington Post and you set up a news organization, then maybe a lot of people would like, love to work for you, but do you have any <laughs> thoughts about this? My question. Okay. Um, you asked the question, uh, what is the future of journalism? I'd like to know the answer to that question, too. And uh, obviously we don't know, and there are layoffs. The news business is going through a real convulsion now. Uh, I think Evelyn and the young people are going to be, people like that are going to be those who founded Google and Facebook and Microsoft, that they're going to be a group of people we're going to look at this and say, wait a minute, we've got to, if, if our information system is clogged up with bad data uh, in a democracy, that'll finish us off. So we've got to get good data in it. I think younger people are going to realize that uh, and we'll find the business model. I don't know what the business model is, obviously. I'm 67 years old and, you know, I'm not thinking there. But there are people who, uh, who are, and I think we'll be able to do it. So what is that? Uh, it was a note for me to use my microphone. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I actually used to be in the broadcast journalism business myself, yes, and I've forgotten how to do this. Yes, uh, right up here. We have two questions, and we'll just go one to the next. And to the Hello, very end. I'm Yonggi Kim Runo, professor at GW. Chair of the East Asian Languages and Literatures. Uh, in the actually very globalized world, how should you or any journalist tell the other side of the story? 
what is the role of foreign language education? Because it seems to be less and less emphasized in the United States. And, and by the other side of the story, you mean Those from other who countries? Speak, yes. Yes. Well, I think that's uh, an important element, and it's one of the things we we miss way too often, and uh, should do better on. Uh, when you first said the other side of the story, I thought, well, what we tried to do in this book is tell you what Obama said and did and thought. Same with Vice President Biden, adopt. Not his perspective is good or bad or legitimate or illegitimate, but here it is. The same with the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, uh, the intelligence people, the other people in the White House and so forth. So all the uh, perspectives are there, but it is missing the perspective of, it has a little of the Pakistanis, President Karzai in Afghanistan and so forth, but it does not have uh, the other countries that are involved, our allies in this war. Hi, my name is Priya, um, I'm a reporter. And this is kind of piggybacking off a lot of other people's questions as well. But it seems like most major newspapers and television channels are cutting their foreign correspondence. And I was just wondering what you thought of um, the coverage of the Afghan war in the mainstream media. It seems like there are so many polls that show that Americans are so disconnected from the war and people don't really care that much. And when you watch the news all day, it seems like you know, there's rarely ever a mention of what's really going on over there. Yes, and uh, I can't account for that except to say uh, how many people here really know somebody well or have a family member who's in the U.S. military? Raise your hand. Okay, there are a few, but how many people here have served in the U.S. military? You know, there are 10 of us, and that's it. And if that, and there's... a a disconnect. Uh, Secretary Gates gave a very excellent speech, I thought, down at Duke in September about uh, the Afghan war is kind of like a video game to lots of people. They feel unconnected. Uh, I think that's a real shame. I think if we had the draft, we would uh, look at it very differently as a country, and, you know, maybe we should have the draft. Who knows? I think it's a a sad uh, situation uh, where we have a group of people who have served uh, this country. I, a couple of months ago, there was a soldier, army ranger, uh, who was killed. Uh, it's from Maryland, I think 29 years old, had served 10, 10 tours, count them. 10? 10. ten uh, eight in Iraq and four in Afghanistan. Uh, left a wife, two kids, and the wife is uh, pregnant. And, uh, you know, let me just, what do we owe those of us who are United States citizens, the people who were over there serving and fighting on our behalf? What do we owe them? Anyone? Pardon? A lot. A lot? Okay. How about everything? How about everything? There are surrogates. And what percentage of what they need, and what they need is not just a kind of token, uh, you know, we'll clap and stand when they walk through the airport, or have a yellow ribbon on the automobile, or uh, kind of cringe when uh, is, there is the story in today's paper about six soldiers being killed in Afghanistan. Um, we, we've got to connect to that as a population. Now, to, I'll be candid and get myself in trouble here, uh, but it's been uh, videotaped, but I'm gonna say, I'll say what's on my mind. It's a leadership question. And it starts with the president, and it has to do with the military leaders need to communicate that the country is behind this unambiguously, uh, and if the president and the country is not, then we need to get out or withdraw. And uh, I think it's kind of in or out, and uh, 
I, I just I think the leadership uh, question is uh, left hanging too often and uh, not answered. And I found this uh, interesting. President Bush never, to my knowledge, gave a speech or did an ad, a recruiting ad, for the military. He praised the military, loved the military. President Obama praises the military, I believe uh, loves it, understands intellectually the nature of the immense sacrifice that is made. But here we have the leaders. Why aren't they out there saying, doing the, you know, why is there somebody doing the recruiting ad for the Marine Corps and the Army who we don't know? Why isn't the Commander-in-Chief doing it? The um, Post has been running excellent articles about the soldiers, their medical care, trauma units, and the rest. And Walter Reed was a Post story, if I'm not mistaken. So the Post is certainly doing its part to bring that to the attention of the American people. Last week, an interesting... But, but, but never enough. I, mean, I, I really think that... Uh, I agree with you, those stories are excellent and so forth, but uh, I don't think you can cover the war enough. Uh, and I think the Post does an excellent job, makes a, a giant commitment financially and in terms of personnel to covering the war, but I don't think you can do it enough. I think when our children or our grandchildren read the history books, what the outcome of the war in Afghanistan, in particular, war in Iraq, war on terror, the outcome is going to tell you about much about the direction and the fate of the United States. We've got a question in the corner over here. Hi, my name is Jamie. I'm from the GW Hatchet. Um, my I, question I told you. <laughs> It was piggybacking what you touched upon before about blogging. Um, what are your thoughts on Twitter and social, do you think social media is decreasing journalism's credibility? No, I mean, it's, it's social media and uh, it's there and it means a lot to people. People's family and their friends mean a lot. How many people here have f uh, Facebook accounts that are active that you check daily or more often? Raise your hands. Eh? Part of your life. Uh, I have a Facebook page that Evelyn runs. <laughs> right. I think I've never looked at it. <laughs> She's got me doing all kinds of weird things. <laughs> okay, we're, we're getting more and more questions. Please, yeah. sir, right here. Yeah. You served in the military. Yes, sir. What, my, my name's Leo Mahoney. I'm an Elliott School alumnus. Thank you for a great education. I'm an active duty Army officer. I've been in the Army 28 years. What, you were a colonel now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Veteran of the Afghan War. And most Don't call them. me sir. I got out of the Navy as a <laughs> lieutenant. <laughs> I used to be an NCO, son. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say that um, you did, a, in my opinion, humble opinion, you did a good job describing the you know, the complex challenges regarding the security environment in Afghanistan, it's not difficult. Um, I had the opportunity to, to brief uh, General Jones, who was at the time SAC here back in 05, 06, when the fight was moving from a conventional fight to an asymmetric fight, and things have kind of gotten worse since then. And it, it caught my ear when you said you almost named the book Obama Divided. Or the because, Divided or, Man. The Divided or... Man, because in a way I kind of see the same maybe struggle that he's going through and the senior leaders in our military and our government are going through about how long, you know, we've been there longer than the Soviets. Um, I had the opportunity in 04 as a young major to ask then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Peter Pace, because at this time we're fighting both Iraq at a, at a very high level of intensity and in the background, Afghanistan, how long as a nation can we afford $5 billion a month? And in 04, the answer off the record or on the record was, I mean, we have a large GDP. He left it open-ended. Um, but as we know, you know, there's a finite limit of resources. And not only the U.S. is going through this, but um, the entire world. So this kind of touches on the different points. Um, but I'll just ask you, 
um, with respect. I'd rather to, hear you talk. <laughs> you know more than any of us. No, no. Um, a, a divided. I think. I think if Americans in general, I think we correlate the conflict in Afghanistan with the attack on 9/11. We see Iraq a lot differently, and I'll leave that off the table. So, with respect to American support as a you know, a military member for almost 30 years, I, who came in just a little after the Vietnam conflict, I'm not that old, but I still remember those days. I'm glad that as a nation, we really support our military. I mean, we really, really do. And I think, like you said, it depends on leadership and how long we tie our presence in Afghanistan to trying to prevent another 9-11. And I think a lot goes a long way along with our allies as, as well, how long the world in general supports what we're doing in Afghanistan, but it's, it's difficult. So thanks for the book. Okay. I enjoyed reading it. Great. Um, I could, uh, there are 10 or 12 implied questions in what you said. And uh, let me just uh, take one of them. You said you talked to General Pace, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I remember interviewing him for one of my Bush books. And uh, I asked him, uh, you have any doubt about the Iraq war? They said, absolutely none, zero, zero doubt. I said, no doubt. And he said, none. And, just, and I said, well, in my business, we mainline doubt. We live off doubt. And he looked at me sincerely and he said, I feel sorry for you. And I said, uh, don't feel sorry for me that uh, doubt is an essential ingredient in any profession. And one of his predecessors as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Bill Crow, after he retired, uh, taught at the Naval Academy and used to have me come every year to talk to the midshipmen. And he'd call me up and say, will you come talk to my midshipmen again? Now, talk to them about doubt. Talk to them about the importance of doubt. And uh, I think, uh, I th I think it, it's a critical element. And let me tell a quick story. And it, the, the story is about uh, not having enough doubt, about getting it wrong, quite frankly, which happens uh, way too often in my business. And this was... Uh, about a month after Nixon resigned, so it was September 1974, Gerald Ford was president, and as some of you may remember, uh, Ford went on television early on a Sunday morning and announced he was giving Nixon a full pardon for Watergate. And he went on television early on a Sunday morning hoping no one would notice. <laughs> but it was widely noticed. <laughs> Uh, but not by me. I was asleep. And uh, my colleague, Carl Bernstein, woke me up. And Carl, who truly then and still has the ability to say what happened uh, in the fewest words with the most drama, said to me, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. <laughs> I got it, <laughs> figured it out, and for years thought uh, there was something dirty about the pardon, that there was a deal that uh, Ford would get the presidency, but he had to agree to pardon Nixon. Uh, there was an aroma, a deep aroma of injustice. Forty people went to jail because of Watergate. The guy at the top gets off. How do you have a system of accountability and justice if that's the case? And I thought this without doubt and for sure for about 25 years and decided to do one of my books on the legacy of Watergate in the American presidency, focusing on Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush Sr., and Clinton. I called Gerald Ford up and said, I'd like to interview you about the pardon. And I thought he would say no, but he said fine. And, I, and for hours, I interviewed him uh, in New York, Colorado, where he had a home, his main home in Rancho Mirage, 
California. And uh, w I was able to interview everyone who was alive and who was involved in the pardon. Uh, got all the legal memos, looked at all the memoirs, looked at the contemporary coverage. And to make it short, I mean, Ford said to me, he said, look, I pardon Nixon not for Nixon, not for myself, but for the country. We, we had to get bad economic times. We were in the middle of the Cold War. We couldn't have Nixon and his travails dominating the news, uh, more investigation, indictment, trial, perhaps jailing him. I said, I had to have my own presidency. The country needed to move on. The country needed to heal. And I examined all of this and wrote in the book Shadow about the legacy of Watergate in these five presidencies that uh, I agreed with Ford. In fact, he was quite right. It was a gutsy thing to do. And Caroline Kennedy, the daughter of John F. Kennedy, called me up and said, I read in your book about Ford, and I and my uncle Teddy Kennedy, then the senator from Massachusetts, have decided we're going to give Gerald Ford the Profiles and Courage Award for doing something in the tradition that my father wrote about in his book, Profiles and Courage. Somebody stepping out of the mainstream, somebody not being inhibited by conventional wisdom, somebody looking ahead and saying uh, the large purpose of the presidency is to look out for the country as a whole. And so there, six months, some, some months later, was Ford accepting at the Kennedy Library the Profiles and Courage Award and uh, seared into my head is this idea you can be so sure of something so absolutely convinced it is right, and then it is subjected to extensive and neutral examination over time, and it stands itself on its head, 180 degrees. Uh, in journalism and in your lives, you encounter that time and time again, so it makes you, uh, Evelyn was saying, as we're approaching this book, we, we and the research for it, we weren't sure. And we were getting little fragments. It was really, OK, what does this mean? What happened here? Are we sure? Uh, it is not seizing an idea or a perspective, political or otherwise, and saying, this is the book, uh, just because it so often turns out to be uh, not what you thought, and I'm sure in your academic life or your personal life, time and time again, you're going to see that. And the alarming, just personally for me alarming, is to see people on television, pe people uh, in the blogosphere, people uh, in, on one side or the other of the partisan divide, so sure that something is a certain way. And uh, it may be totally right, and it may be totally wrong. And so it's, it's a great lesson, and I, I think it's pretty much agreed General Pace was not a very successful chairman of the Joint Chiefs in terms of presenting independent military advice to the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Council. Pardon? I said that you nodded, though. <laughs> yes, you did. They, they've got the camera on me, but I saw you nod. Well, you can't be court-martialed for a nod, particularly <laughs> when you deny it. Um, I don't think... No, but you can... No, wait a minute. He's not in office now. You can make a judgment on him. You prefer not to. Okay. And I'm sure that's not the first time that somebody that you've asked a use question said, microphone. I prefer not to. Right. Okay, I'm sorry, use my microphone. <laughs> um, 
I don't think we could end this session on a better note than what we've just heard from Bob Woodward. So I would like to, I was given a signal of one more, and I'm going to do the one more, which is, what is the next book that you and Evelyn are going to bring out to us? Do you have an idea yet? No, we don't know, because what, you know, it's, the world is very confusing. And, uh, we're, you know, you try to write about things that are of consequence in topic A, and uh, it's not readily, uh, at least at this time in November 2010, what, uh, what topic A is. And uh, hopefully uh, we will find it in some way. The, can I tell one more yeah, of course, story of course that is not, uh, not about... Uh, I've, this was a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and my wife and I were at another one of these conferences. You think I go to conferences all the time? I don't. Uh, and they had a panel on aging, and it's something that interests me a great deal at this point in my life. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they had... Uh, psychologist, doctor, psychiatrist, and James Watson, who was the co-discoverer of DNA on the panel, and everyone was holding forth about, oh, it's wonderful to age, and you know, somebody had written a book, uh, I'm finally 100 and can enjoy life. And <laughs> Dr. Watson hadn't said anything, and the moderator finally at the end said, Dr. Watson, uh, what... Uh, you know, what do you think about aging? How do you cope with aging? How do you deal with aging? And he looked up and he said, I have one piece of advice for how to deal with aging. Stay away from old people. <laughs> <laughs> now, the story's not done. So, <laughs> sitting in front of my wife and myself was Henry Kissinger, the former <laughs> National Security <laughs> Advisor, yes. and part of this panel was they handed out little sheets where you self-score your, uh, how, uh, you know, kind of your health, uh, how often do you exercise, how many bowel movements do you have a, a week, uh, do you uh, eat red meat, have you smoked, you know, other conditions and so forth, and you go and then you add it all up and it tells you how many years you have to live. And so we're, Kissinger is doing this, and so we're yeah. <laughs> journalists. It seems it's fair <laughs> to look. And he goes through, scores it all up, and uh, turns out he died four years <laughs> ago. <laughs> Dr. Kissinger was not happy with this discovery. So he decided to open negotiations with each of the questions. <laughs> and uh, it turned out he didn't smoke. It turned out uh, he exercised 11 times a day. <laughs> Turns out he never uh, ate any red meat in the last 45 years. <laughs> and so and he, going through a pencil, rescoring this, and at the end, the, the rescore after extensive shuttle diplomacy, uh, turned out he had eight years to live. Now, what was fascinating about that was, not surprising, but to see it in the raw, this, he wanted to live. He wanted to survive. And he, he, all of a sudden, he received uh, indication and information that he wasn't going to survive. Instead of changing his behavior, maybe he did change his behavior, he renegotiated. <laughs> and if you read his books, you will find the same uh, tendency to renegotiate with the facts and what really happened uh, time and time again. But it is, in, uh, in the end, uh, it is a survival game. And it was interesting to see somebody like that, right before Absolutely. our eyes, go into a panic. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, we do not know the name or the subject of your next book, but I would like to give a token of appreciation. Now I'm going to have to get away from my microphone. To both you and Evelyn, 
for when you do write it, here are your official George Washington University pens <laughs> for the purpose of taking pen to paper or however you go about this. We're delighted that you've been here. We're delighted that you can spend a few moments outside signing books if you still have time. And let us all thank Bob Woodward and Alan. <laughs>